moving right along to number three, the inner solar system. Now, the inner solar system, and most specifically the planet Mercury, is one of the biggest problems with the heliocentric model, uh, specifically the fact that Mercury itself is often visible well after sunset. Now, this may not sound very impressive at first, however, basic geometry and a dash of common sense prove that the so-called planet Mercury should never be visible after sunset from anywhere on Earth. Uh, besides possibly one of the poles during its respective summer, but even then it would be highly unlikely to view Mercury after sunset, as it is allegedly 137 million miles away from the Earth at its furthest, and 47 million miles away from the Earth at its nearest. Now, much like the orientation of the crescent moon, the hypothetical orbital path of the planet Mercury would necessarily be positioned in alignment to the day side of the Earth as a rule, with zero exceptions. Uh, visibility of space only occurs between the twilight hours, you know, during the nighttime. Therefore, space cannot be observed during the daytime under normal circumstances, of course. Now, once an observer has theoretically spun around past the twilight zone or the terminator line along to the dark side of the Earth, uh, they would be roughly a thousand miles past the terminator line, uh, about an hour after sunset thus rendering any possibility of a line of sight towards Mercury's orbital path as a geometrical impossibility. Now, assuming the heliocentric theory, of course. Now, Mercury can often be spotted well after dusk, and even after complete sunset, something which defies any rational explanation according to the heliocentric layout. Furthermore, the very small size of the planet relative to the alleged astronomical distances involved from the Earth should uh, kill off the heliocentric values uh, simply due to the angular size of Mercury being out of whack with the uh, numbers that they give us. We're going to pop right back into this, but I wanted to play a quick excerpt from a recent video that I did. It is uh, The Globe is Dead, Section 1, and um, I also did a follow-up to this in The Globe is Dead, Section 3.5. So I'll put links uh, as well as cards right here for your convenience. Uh, as well as a card for the entire series playlist because there's a lot of good stuff in there and I do go a bit more in depth into the uh, measurements in terms of uh, Mercury and Venus and this impossibility according to the heliocentric model of course so let's roll the clip here's just sort of an enlarged top-down view of um, what we're describing here uh, you can see you've got the day side of Earth You've got sort of the twilight hours. Um, I would say that the sun gets a 30 minute boost. I don't know. From the atmospheric refraction. So 30 minutes after sunset would be somewhere around in here. And again, you know, your line of sight is going to be a tangent. That's actually giving it some credit there. It should be a wider angle going that way. Uh, but your line of sight is going to be a tangent to that curve. And uh, just to put this in a little bit better perspective, uh, there's no way to show how small a person would be looking, you know, off into space from here trying to see Mercury or Venus. Um, but just to give you sort of an idea, since this is a sphere, there's a little guy, but oh, not that little guy, the other little guy. Not him. The littler guy, no, the littler guy, no, the littler guy, the littler guy, you know, so this doesn't even begin, this would be like where the ISS is, so, but you can see that um, looking straight, you know, parallel with the ground is uh, going to appear to be a convergent line with the ground due to the laws of perspective, 
Uh, however, in order to see, you know, stars over the horizon, you're going to have to look up, so, you know, a few degrees uh, up. You're not going to look down towards the ground. You're not going to look directly at the uh, or parallel with the ground because, again, it can, your line of sight converges with the ground. So in order to see stars or planets, you're going to have to look up. You're, you know, your line of sight is going to be uh, a tangent to the curve of the Earth. So just backing up this, all these little guys sort of gives you an idea of how small we the observer would be on this spherical Earth. And when you get over to, you know, here, and you're trying to see around this huge curve, you're trying to see something that's, um, when you're trying to see something that is uh, on the on the day side of, of this area, which is the day side, uh, the orbital path of Mercury would never intersect with our line of sight during the evening or nighttime. Now, again, when Venus is at its closest, it would be at high noon and when it's at its furthest it would be at high noon on the opposite side of the Sun right uh, same thing goes with mercury when it's at its closest it would be at high noon and when it's at its furthest away it would be at high noon but on the opposite end of the Sun so you'd never see it and not to mention this orbital path would never converge with your line of sight from the Earth. At night, of course. So with that brief excerpt out of the way, given the uh, purported size of Mercury and the alleged distances, even at its nearest, um, the angular size of that object would be way too small for the human eye to discern especially when you're dealing with uh, indirect reflected light. We'll get into that in a minute. Now, they claim that or, uh, Mercury's orbital radius is about 35 million miles on average, while the Earth is, of course, supposedly orbiting the Sun at a distance of about 93 million miles, more than double the orbital radius of Mercury. Just for a little bit more background in terms of the heliocentric model's assertions in terms of Mercury, um, it is allegedly about 3.4 degrees offset or misaligned from the ecliptic plane. And so in this diagram, the, uh, you can see the little Earth on both sides of the sun representing you know, two opposing seasons. And that line in between would be representative of the uh, ecliptic plane or the single plane around which the Earth orbits the sun allegedly. And you can sort of see the red line, the short red line uh, in the center uh, going through the sun representing the uh, approximate uh, orbital radius of Mercury, as well as the 3.39 degree offset uh, from the Earth's ecliptic plane. Now, this next slide that you see just sort of shows the Sun's path relative to the ecliptic, as well as the alleged orbital path of the planet or wandering star Mercury. Uh, so what's going on is the sun is traveling in a direction contrary to that of uh, Mercury and the Earth. But just looking back at this uh, first diagram a little bit better, because the sun's path, that'll uh, come in a later section in terms of orbital mechanics. But um, back to this first diagram, it shows that the divergence from the ecliptic in terms of Mercury is not all that great. So you can more or less say that uh, Mercury would be aligned to the Earth's ecliptic plane more or less for the majority of the time, uh, humoring the heliocentric model, of course. Uh, so what this means is that you really can't make the argument that you could somehow get a uh, tilted Earth view of Mercury during the northern summer solstice at midnight or whatever, I don't know.
Okay, so let's take a look at this a uh, couple of different ways. Uh, we're looking at the same diagram, which is, you know, pretty much a two-scale model of the inner, sol uh, inner solar system in terms of the orbital radius and, of course, the planets, you know, including Earth and the others uh, being, you know, microscopic to this scale. Uh, Earth would be so small you can't even see it from this view. Maybe I could zoom way in on it and get a, a pretty bloated estimate of what the Earth would be in this sort of size uh situation but um, just sort of uh, keep in mind that yes these other two orbital planes are slightly misaligned and especially let's just deal with uh, Mercury in the center the central red orbital ring uh, that's only misaligned from our ecliptic by a mere 3.39 degrees I think if I said it earlier anyway uh, you can pr practically say that all of these uh, planets are more or less adherent to the ecliptic more or less and so what I'm gonna do to show this one way is you can see the first set of tangent lines that uh, appear here are the blue dotted tangent lines which represent your line of sight towards the uh, horizon after sunset or before sunrise because again your line of sight is always going to be a tangent to the curve of the earth and say 30 minutes after sunset or an hour after sunset um, that's going to be about your uh, line of sight towards um, visible space maximum uh, coming away from the day side of the earth or going towards the day side of the earth because again once it turns into daytime then visible space goes through the twilight phase and you can no longer see visible space um, and so this is a uh, sort of a conservative estimate giving Venus sort of the benefit of the doubt and stating that you may be able to see Venus under some very bizarre uh, uncommon circumstances if the conditions are right but it would be a partially lit like a crescently lit Venus but we're not even talking about Venus uh, we're talking about Mercury here and so the two lines that you can see appearing now indicated as red dotted lines indicate the line of sight that you would need to see the planet Mercury according to the heliocentric model after sunset now, as you can see, um, these two red tangent lines are much, much, much more acute um, as opposed to the blue tangent lines representing what our uh, last view or, you know, our earliest and latest view towards visible space should be. So there may be room for uh, the visibility of a very, very partially lit Venus under rare circumstances uh, indicated by the blue lines, although that is very generous to Venus uh, because the sun does get sort of a bonus on uh, both sides. Uh, and, but again, that's due to refraction allegedly according to mainstream science. But of course, we can clearly see uh, not only Mercury, but also Venus, and sometimes Mercury, Venus, and Jupiter nearly aligned in the same sky after sunset. And so hopefully you can see that the uh, from this sort of uh, top-down diagram of the inner solar system, that there should technically not be a line of sight towards Mercury any time after sunset. Again, the... Uh, the, the maximum of that should be indicated by the blue lines uh, going back towards the night side like away from the Sun and uh, certainly we should only be able to see mercury during the day certainly not a half an hour or an hour after sunset this next slide shows an obviously exaggerated size of the planet or wandering star mercury just to sort of prove a point that even if by some bizarre coincidence but let's just say that we could achieve a line of sight towards mercury after sunset it would necessarily be you know uh, in sort of the alignment that you can see there if we if we were somehow in some magical universe able to see uh, or get a line of sight towards mercury after sunset it would be necessarily at around the position that you see it there 
um, meaning we would always see like a half lit or maybe less, you know, maybe like a crescent lit uh, Mercury just simply due to the alignments involved. But again, uh, after sunset, our line of sight should be indicated uh, maximum by the blue lines, um, which are cutting it very close to Venus, although I am being very generous to this uh erring on the side of the globe for caution in this uh, to be generous to the to the conventional model but even still uh, mercury itself uh, should definitely never be visible after sunset and of course in this diagram I've got it about a million times bigger than the Sun so it's just to show you uh, the the point it's not supposed to be to scale that um, yeah, Mercury would only be partially lit if we could ever get a line of sight towards it. Because obviously you're never going to see a no moon during the day, just as you would never see a no Mercury during the day, which would be at its nearest point in alignment with the Sun. And of course you'd never see a full lit Mercury as it would be on the opposite side of the Sun. Hypothetically, you know, considering the preposterous, absurd, heliocentric hypothesis. And finally, the last slide, just to give you an idea of what the day side of the Earth would be, as opposed to the night side of the Earth. And again, I know a lot of people are going to complain about this, but once you've gone around to say in half an hour or an hour past sunset um, you, this is actually being generous to the spherical earth because um, frankly the earth is much larger than us our uh, optical ground horizon is about three and a half miles away if you're a six foot tall observer and humoring the heliocentric model once you've gone around that curve of the earth even for an hour you've gone around uh, over a thousand miles over a curve uh, which indicates to uh, a hundred and thirty five mile uh, vertical descent facing away from the planet uh, Mercury and Venus and so hopefully that cleared it up a bit although I do have a couple of other slides that I want to show to uh, drive the point home in terms of especially the planet Venus and how its visibility after sunset uh, clearly disagrees with the heliocentric model we couldn't possibly see the planet Mercury after sunset according to the very heliocentric model uh, yet we can see it quite frequently so let's bust out this next slide uh, because again the only way that Mercury could ever be visible would obviously not be when it's at its nearest because that would be aligned to the Sun at high noon um, obviously we can't see Mercury during the day um, so if there were ever any sort of chance to get a line of sight towards Mercury it would have to be when it was either east or west of the Sun if you will because you'd be looking at a uh, reflection of it as opposed to a no moon phase mercury if that makes any sense so that that would put mercury at um, you know way further than its closest distance but that's the only way that you could ever possibly conceivably get a line of sight towards mercury which is impossible uh, due to the fact that we need the reflected light of the sun in order for this to work so this is obviously not to scale but it's just to show the point that the quarter lit mercury would be west of the sun and this is not to scale uh, however it would be a very difficult thing to do to scale especially given the size of the alleged spherical earth and the alleged distance to mercury and the sun but this just sort of gives you an idea if you're looking uh, you know up towards the sun at noon then mercury would be roughly in that position you know maybe a little higher or lower and you know maybe a little further off to the uh, left you know just to give you an idea that's about where mercury would be uh, in this diagram if we're humoring this preposterous scenario where mercury is somehow visible uh, you know during the day but certainly never after 
sunset, as you can see in this next slide, just stacking another image on top of this, this would be you, the observer, uh, half an hour or maybe an hour after sunset. So, as you can clearly see in both of these sets of diagrams, that it would be physically impossible to view Mercury after sunset, and technically the only time we should be able to view Mercury would be during the day, and that would only be during certain times when the uh, planet Mercury allegedly is not in a uh, no Mercury phase where it's aligned to the Sun and its nearest point, uh, nor would it be during a full Mercury phase when it's allegedly on the opposite side of the Sun, but it would necessarily be, you know, off to the west or east of the Sun, uh, either way, you know, sim same. Uh, however, that, that would mean that you would necessarily only ever see a um, half-lit or maybe a crescent-lit Mercury. Um, but again, you know, the, the simple fact that we can see fully lit Mercuries, <laughs> you know, planted Mercuries in the sky uh, after dark, uh, half hour, hour after sunset sometimes, uh, conclusively disproves the heliocentric theory. And it is, you know, yet another excellent reason why the heliocentric team is an epic failure and continually fall flat on their face when it comes to simple common sense logic and scrutinizing their ridiculous, absurd, preposterous model as uh, rational adults as opposed to toddlers. <coughs> Now, the knee-jerk, brain-dead reaction to this uh, inconvenient fact is one of the most disheartening forms of cognitive dissonance you can expect to encounter in your experience as a vocal proponent for the truth about Flat Earth. Instead of considering the geometrical configuration of our hypothetical solar system logically and the implications of such observations of Mercury in the night sky, which is geometrically impossible according to the model, uh, people will generally refuse to consider the evidence logically, uh, vehemently defending their belief system using totally irrational, self-reinforcing fallacies along the lines of, well, we can obviously see Mercury after sunset, and I know the Earth is a spinning sphere 8,000 miles in diameter orbiting the Sun, therefore, it must be possible to see Mercury after sunset from the spinning sphere globe. From the spinning globe Earth, duh. Um, this sort of logical thinking is a, a big problem for most people looking into Flat Earth because it's almost impossible to look at the uh, raw data objectively without juxtaposing, you know, heliocentric values into your thought processes or without assuming that the Earth is a sphere no matter what. That's what people tend to do. They will assume that the Earth is a sphere no matter what. Uh, this sort of uh, dismissal of a valid contradiction <laughs> in the heliocentric premise is only possible because we are hardwired to uh, defend our belief systems. So a lot of people will simply refuse to consider that the very observation being examined here in terms of Mercury, which categorically contradicts the physical layout of the heliocentric theory yet again, much as the observations of the Moon uh, does in the case of the full moon during the day or the crescent moon in the middle of the night. Mercury could never possibly be positioned in such a manner where it would be visible after the sun has set 
as our line of sight will always be a tangent to the curve, a hypothetical curve of the Earth, meaning that the ground itself should act as an impenetrable obstacle to our line of sight towards space, uh, completely obscuring the inner solar system after sunset. And it also sort of goes without saying that whenever the sun is out, uh, or visible, or you know, before the sun sets, uh, space becomes obscured by the blue sky. Therefore, Mercury should technically never be visible with the naked eye, unless you can catch a rare glimpse of it during the fringes of twilight hours, which, uh, quite frankly, I would say even that is really pushing it. But we should certainly never see Mercury after sunset, according to the heliocentric model itself. Now, the other major problem with the visibility of the wandering star Mercury involves the alleged size of the planet relative to the distance involved, compounded by the fact that we're dealing with reflected sunlight, indirect reflected sunlight no less, causing the wandering star to be visible. While Mercury is at its nearest point to the Earth, about 48 million miles from the Earth, allegedly, it would be aligned to the Sun almost directly from an observer on the Earth. Now, on the other hand, at its furthest, 138 million miles from the Earth, uh, Mercury would be on the opposite side of the Sun as the Earth in alignment with the Earth and the Sun. So, do it during these two points when Mercury is at its nearest to the Earth, or at its furthest from the Earth, it would necessarily be in direct alignment with the Earth and Sun. Now, at its closest point, Mercury would be aligned to the Sun, according to an observer on Earth, roughly 45 million miles closer to the Earth than the Sun, allegedly. Now, this would place Mercury in between the, the Earth and the Sun, creating essentially a no-Mercury phase during broad daylight. So you would certainly never be able to see Mercury at its closest because it would there would be no reflected light possible since it's in alignment with the sun and it would be aligned to the day side of the earth so never could see it at its closest period now on the other hand at its furthest point mercury would be on the opposite side of the sun uh, roughly 45 million miles further than the sun in direct alignment with the sun according to an observer on the earth it would be a full 138 million miles away with the sun directly in between us and mercury allegedly so, in neither of these cases could Mercury conceivably be visible after sunset, uh, since the planet would be aligned to the Sun in both cases, more or less. When at its closest, Mercury should be in between the Earth and the Sun, preventing any chance of sunlight to conceivably reflect from Mercury's surface towards the Earth, much like the no-moon phase is uh, allegedly caused by the Moon being in alignment between the Earth and the Sun. Uh, similarly, Mercury should experience a 0% lit phase while it's nearest to the Earth, aligned to the Sun, and would only be fully lit according to an observer on Earth when it is on the opposite side of the Sun. Ergo, the only possible way you can even attempt a line of sight towards a full lit Mercury would be if you could travel through the Sun <laughs> uh, and then look at Mercury. Uh, the only way you could attempt a line of sight towards Mercury after sunset, which is, of course, physically, geometrically impossible, assuming the Earth is a sphere, but, you know, just for shits and giggles, you would only ever get a partially lit planet during a portion of its orbit relative to the Earth when it is in a less than half-lit phase, uh, placing Mercury at maximum misalignment to the Sun. And, of course, this diagram here just sort of gives you an exaggerated example of what Mercury should look like if you could possibly catch a glimpse of it, say, during twilight in some freakish circumstance. If you could get a line of sight towards Mercury after sunset, um, it, it would necessarily be uh, a crescent object if it's you know humoring the heliocentric model of course so just wanted to put that sort of exaggerated example so you guys could see what i mean so of course there's no possible way to theoretically achieve a line of sight towards even a half-lit mercury 
uh, where it's at its extremities of its orbit relative to the Earth's alignment with the Sun. Um, so you could achieve that line of sight uh, towards a half-lit Mercury after sunset on the spherical Earth model. Now, apparently, fully lit instances of Mercury well after sunset serve as an excellent proof against the notion of a heliocentric model, where Mercury is supposedly orbiting the Sun on a tighter course compared to the Earth. In reality, the wandering star Mercury certainly cannot be seen with the naked eye during the day at its closest point, as it couldn't possibly be in a position to reflect sunlight, uh, nor could it be visible at its furthest point, or at its fully lit stage, you know, according to an observer on Earth, because the fact that the sun itself should be directly in between the Earth and Mercury, as well as the daytime sky blotting out the stars and the wandering stars, uh, which leaves only the extreme uh, half-lit phases as the only remote possibility of instances where Mercury could be visible after sunset, although, again, a line of sight towards that would be unachievable after sunset from a spherical Earth. In order for Mercury to be fully lit, according to an observer on the Earth, it would necessarily be placed on the opposite side of the Sun, rendering any chance to view Mercury completely impossible during both day and night, as you certainly cannot see something above your head during the day, when it should be past the Sun over 130 million miles away, nor could you see it in the night sky when it should be millions of miles beneath your feet through thousands of miles of the hypothetical curved Earth sphere. Even in some freakish, impossible scenario where the planet Mercury could be fully lit at its closest point, the minuscule angular size of the object should render it far beyond the point of possible visibility to the naked eye. Again, at its nearest point, Mercury is allegedly about 48 million miles away and has a diameter of nearly 3,000 miles, uh, allegedly, which means its angular size would be microscopic, according to an observer on Earth. And, of course, it would not be reflecting any sunlight, so you couldn't see it anyway. Now, but if you believe that you can see an object smaller than the Earth, from 48 million miles away with the naked eye then you really need to think this through because our eyes are only capable of distinguishing uh, a fraction of a degree in terms of angular size and frankly a 3,000 mile object 48 million miles away uh, would be way too small an angular size to see, even if there was reflected sunlight in that situation, which there obviously couldn't be. In truth, the only way that one could even come close to a viable attempt to achieve a line of sight towards Mercury after sunset would be during a phase when Mercury is at its furthest from its alignment to the Sun and the Earth, although the line of sight towards Mercury's orbital path should still be physically impossible to achieve, according to the very geometrical layout of the heliocentric model, but again, for argument's sake, we'll assume that a line of sight could be somehow achieved towards Mercury after sunset, which, again, is absolutely impossible, but we're just, you know, doing this for shits and giggles again. Uh, that would place it necessarily at a point in Mercury's orbit when it's towards either extreme misalignment to the Sun and the Earth, according to an observer on the Earth. Now, this is, of course, due to the categorical impossibility of achieving a, line, a, a nighttime line of sight towards Mercury at its furthest and nearest points from Earth, in alignment with the Sun in both instances. Now, if the two extreme half-lit phases of Mercury could somehow be viewed from the night side of the Earth, then the angular size and intensity of the light would be diminished, inhibiting factors in terms of visibility, as well as the distance being considerably further than the 48 million miles uh, away, allegedly depicting its closest point. Um, in fact, Mercury would probably be closer to about 85 million miles away when it's at the sort of half-lit phases or extreme divergence from the Earth-Sun alignment. Uh, so, again, if you believe that you can see a partially lit indirectly lit object which is only 3,000 miles in diameter from about 85 million miles away 
there is a flaw in your understanding as to how our eyes work and the limitations in terms of angular size, which defines the smallest apparent angular size we can discern with the naked eye. At the end of the day, the fact that Mercury is often visible after sunset is clear disproof of the heliocentric model as a line of sight towards Mercury's orbital path from the ground, assuming a spherical Earth, simply wouldn't be possible after sunset. Uh, even in the event that a line of sight could somehow be achieved to Mercury, it would be uh, about 85 million miles away and only partially and indirectly lit meaning it couldn't, be, couldn't possibly be visible from Earth, even if you could get a line of sight towards it, which, according to the heliocentric theory, you really shouldn't be able to get a line of sight towards Mercury after sunset, yet we can, which is why this is one of the top five epic failures of the heliocentric team, just based on simple geometry and logic. Now, there are a few factors at play here, including how sunlight supposedly behaves in the heliocentric model, uh, essentially providing the sun with a slight boost beyond the twilight zone as a rule, since the sunlight is alleged to curve around the Earth a bit due to atmospheric and theoretical gravitational lensing. So, to summarize, the inner solar system is one of the best pieces of evidence against the heliocentric model simply because we can view uh, Mercury especially after sunset. The fact, and hopefully you know this isn't lost on anyone, if, if it still doesn't make sense, you know maybe watch through it again, or I'm planning on doing another live hangout on my channel sometime soon where we can, uh, I can answer questions from you know people that are in the chat. I'll uh, take some phone calls and if you guys uh, out there have any questions about this video let me know. I know it's sort of complicated. Uh, it can be complex but um, really the it's pretty simple once you get it. Um, the fact of the matter is is that um, night and day are obviously according to the heliocentric model are obviously opposite ends of the sphere. Uh, the daytime side of the sphere is obviously pointing towards the sun with nice blue skies that prevent you from seeing the stars. And of course, on the other hand, you have the nighttime side of Earth, assuming it's a sphere, uh, where you're pointed away from the sun and you can see all the pretty stars. And um, what this means is that, again, this is just sort of summarizing this point, that the inner solar system, especially Mercury, uh, couldn't possibly be visible after sunset for a variety of reasons. And again, even if you could somehow get a line of sight towards it after sunset, it would be like a crescent lit Mercury, uh, thus diminishing its angular size. And so the cherry on top of this is the fact that they claim that an object which is only 3,000 miles in diameter, which is, you know, less than half the size of Earth, um, they claim that that object is visible from, you know, minimum 47 million miles away, but we already discussed how that couldn't possibly be the case. Uh, so somewhere around, you know, 85, maybe closer to 90 million miles away, that's how uh, far Mercury would need to be, you know, even if you could, I don't know, somehow get a line of sight towards it after dark, which again is indeed impossible, but you just have all of these issues that come right along with the inner solar system. Uh, especially in the case of Mercury, which is really sort of the poster child for impossible <laughs> occurrences if we're to assume a heliocentric model. Again, this is uh, simple geometry. Um, it really isn't that complex although there are many, many trolls out there and many, many good people out there as well asking legitimate questions and stuff, but there are 
well, a lot of trolls out there that are always going to argue this sort of thing ad nauseum because either they don't understand it or they're trying to confuse people. I would just urge anyone to do your own experimentation in terms of, uh, well, whatever, flat earth, uh, the stationary earth, the lack of infinite space, uh, the lack of evidence for a Big Bang, the lack of evidence for evolution, the lack of evidence for the heliocentric model, the lack of evidence for Earth curvature, the lack of evidence of orbital velocities, and, you know, with the abundant, literally never-ending mountains, a real, an entire world uh, full of evidence that we've always lived on that uh, quite clearly and self-evidently isn't a spinning sphere. Um, and I know that flat earthers get picked on a lot by pseudo-intellectuals uh, trying to fit in with the herd, but frankly, flat earthers Many of them are amongst the smartest people I've ever met. Flat Earthers have figured something out so important that they're willing to risk their reputations, willing to uh, risk their jobs, perhaps even risk their lives in order to get this truth out. And instead of, uh, you know, the self-proclaimed scientific minds of uh, YouTube land, Instead of uh, debating us on the points, they will use ad hominem attacks and use troll accounts and try to stir up drama between flat earthers and, oh, let's not forget, release just absolutely worthless, uh, nonsensical flat earth videos that uh, are intended to confuse people by throwing in maybe a little bit of flat earth truth, but then mixing it in with 90% just garbage hogwash. And, you know, that's that's sort of where we're, we've been at for the last at least, I don't know, 150 years or so. But times, they are a-changing. Because flat earth is really exploding in the last couple of years. It is burgeoning. Uh, this is a topic that more and more people are becoming familiar with, and frankly, you know, it, it warms my heart to see that it's come this far because, you know, myself and, and many others, um, you know, have worked very hard in spite of a lot of, uh, you know, really quite adverse uh, consequences. Uh, we've worked very hard to get this information out in, in such a way that people can understand it and share it. And, um, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm just, I'm very, very pleased, uh, with the way that things have been going, uh, for the last couple of years in terms of Flat Earth and how many people are catching on to it. And, uh, you know, I, I think that it, it really only can get better and better and better from here. The, the truth will never die. Uh, there's definitely enough people with a firm understanding about the nature of the world, the true nature of the world, and the only way that I see the powers that ought not be uh, averting this crisis to their power structure, because uh, I'm 100% convinced that the Illuminati, if you will, uh, hold most of their control over humanity via the great deception of the heliocentric model, which, you know, in a nutshell, it makes the galaxy insignificant, and by extension, our sun is insignificant, and by extension, the planet is very insignificant, and by further extension, every single person that's ever lived is beyond insignificant. Uh, like, th there isn't even a word for how insignificant uh, we all are, according to the heliocentric sort of Copernican theory. And so, with this truth about Flat Earth, and the fact that 
there is no infinitude of space filled with Jabba the Hutt and Luke Skywalker and Captain Kirk and Drunkle Buzz Aldrin. It's a very comforting thought, and, you know, that's the way that uh, revelation works. And not necessarily getting biblical, just using the term revelation or apocalypse, uh, unveiling a deception that has controlled your very mind for most of your life in many cases. Uh, in, in my case, I lived 34 years of my life uh, completely deceived about, well, pretty much everything I thought I knew about all well, the world, the solar system, the galaxy, the universe. Uh, all of that theoretical nonsense has been so utterly disproven uh, I, I would almost be ashamed of myself for falling for such a r really silly ruse involving a spinning spherical Earth. However, uh, I do remember that when I was very young and I was first uh, told about this whole spinning on a ball thing, I was at first incredulous and you know didn't necessarily believe it well without asking a million questions, but hey, that's just me. The point is, is there's no reason to be ashamed of being deceived. Uh, there's no reason to be ashamed of being fooled. And in fact, it takes an honest, self-confident, strong person to really, you know, look at their belief systems and scrutinize them very heavily especially when we're talking about belief systems based on theoretical physics, which, you know, really is the cornerstone for the modern paradigm, honestly. Um, I guess you could sort of say a microcosm of this sort of thing in an analogous form would be something like a, uh, you know, sort of a more common, uh, less volatile or less controversial belief system that uh, you really love football and your favorite team is the Washington Redskins um, now I'm you know I enjoy watching a football game now and then myself but if you actually think about you know why actually why exactly is it that you are a fan of the Cowboys or the Redskins or whatever the team may be does it's insignificant <laughs> right but uh, if you if you analyze that and you realize that the people on that team don't know you and you spend a lot of money uh, paying for tickets to go see the game and even if you watch it at home you get inundated with uh, advertisements which on a subconscious level they obviously do work to get people to buy things Otherwise, they wouldn't spend billions of dollars a second or whatever, a million dollars or $50 million for 30 seconds on the Super Bowl or whatever. Um, they, they wouldn't pay that much money. Large corporations wouldn't pay that kind of money uh, just on a whim for no reason. So, you know, there's definitely something to these uh, TV advertisements. And so I, I guess what the point is, is if you actually rationalize your love of professional football and your love of the team that you like, uh, most people will say they like the team that they like because either A, they grew up in the city where the team's from, that's probably the most common, or B, uh, their parents grew up in the city where that team's from. And so, you know, football teams are often passed from father to son and Sometimes you have family rival, uh, rivalries, like in mine, I can remember a few uh, family members who were, and this was years ago, were Cowboys fans, and some of them were Redskins fans, and some of them were Miami Dolphins fans, and, you know, this was even before the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars and, and the uh, Carolina Panthers expansion, so this was quite a while ago. I really don't watch football much anymore. Um, but the point is, is uh, 
you know, half the time people like a team because that's the team that their parents and their grandparents liked. And, you know, there's no real connection. Uh, I actually played football for three or four years, uh, way back in the day. And, um, uh, you know, I felt a connection to the team that I was on, but, uh, you know, I've sort of felt vicarious connection between uh, football teams or, you know, basketball teams or whatever. Uh, although, you know, if, if you really analyze that uh, sort of idol that you have in your life, it is sort of an unhealthy thing. I mean, I don't know. At least it's an unnatural thing. I mean, who would really go... I mean, if you, if you break this down to uh, the basics, who would pay... I don't know how much does a basketball ticket cost. $100? Is that probably a lot? Who knows? Let's just say it's $100 to go see a game of basketball. Um, who would really pay $100 to go watch, I don't know, a couple dozen men uh, throw a ball into a circular hoop and run back and forth for a couple hours uh, continuously throwing a ball into a hoop by the way most of these guys make millions of dollars per year and uh, people pay money to, to go see that um, uh, nothing against sports or anything but the, the point that I'm trying to make is that if you analyze certain behavioral patterns that we're all guilty of, I'm guilty of a lot of this stuff too, um, even you know normal, socially acceptable, and socially encouraged things are often pointless wastes of time that are going to cost you money, which you know you're free to spend your money on what you want. Uh, oh, and by the way, there's, here's another one. Uh, have you ever paid money to go see a football game where your team lost? <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice if you only had to pay if your team won? That, that'd be something, right? But uh, anyway, even if you don't go to the game, they get you with the advertisements, and so your, you know, your purchasing habits may be altered as a result of... Uh, watching the game every uh, weekend or all the games all weekend and then the college games and etc etc but nothing against sports the, the point is is you can uh, I mean you can look at pretty much everything superficial in life uh, in this very same way uh, another big one in this same sort of regard is uh, money itself fiat currency uh, you're dealing with uh, a worthless pieces of paper that are backed by no real uh, valuable uh, commodities such as gold or silver. Um, the United States dollar, and I've talked about this before, I know, so I'll be quick with it, but the United States dollar is, uh, well, they call it the petrol dollar because um, all petroleum is priced in U.S. dollars. Uh, furthermore, for many, many years, the uh, U.S. dollar has been the world reserve currency, although there are countries that are, uh, if not, have already done away with that, are in the process of it, and uh, this is obviously because the United States uh, is, well, not the United States, the Federal Reserve Bank is creating money out of thin air loaning out money that doesn't exist at interest, allowing members FDIC branch banks to loan out at least 10 times more money than they have on deposit, meaning they're also creating wealth out of thin air. So you have this sort of uh, inflation just built right in to the very uh, bowels of our economic system. And of course, the uh, issuance and uh, valuation of our currency was uh, strictly intended for Congress and was never supposed to go into the hands of private central banks. Uh, even Andrew Jackson and others uh, were aware of this. And yet here we are, you know, 2017, over 105 years, I believe, 
yeah, because they signed the uh, Federal Reserve Act, I think, in, uh, was it 1913, I want to say? Anyway, it's been a, a hundred years and some change, whatever. Uh, but yeah, the uh, Federal Reserve Bank uh, is not federal and it holds no reserves, and yet they hold the uh, sole responsibility without any oversight, without any auditing. Uh, they actually uh, obviously pull the strings of the government. Um, they're responsible for devaluing our currency over the last hundred years to essentially anywhere from two to perhaps five percent of its value over just a short hundred years. And um, we're, we've been scammed, we've been had. Um, that value doesn't just disappear. Uh, inflate, when money uh, goes to hyperinflation, as we've obviously seen it occur, uh, that's exactly hyperinflation. There's a very small group of people who get very rich off of this because of things like, well, the housing bubble. Um, all of the uh, houses get foreclosed on due to a variety of reasons, but you know these markets are rigged, and so they can pull the plug on things at the perfect time so as to get maximum uh, impact, maximum results. When the housing market crashed, um, you had lots of people uh, obviously lose their homes, and you know they essentially what happened was their home was worth less than the mortgage they ha had out on it because of the housing uh, market collapse. And so the banks uh, foreclosed on these houses. And banks, uh, they're really quite immoral because um, they'll turn around and sell that same house that's uh, poor you know, Joe Sixpack has been paying a mortgage on for 10 years, right? Or however long. Um, and say he owes $50,000 left on the house, just throwing a number out there. Well, they'll, they'll foreclose on him and spend a ton of money to uh, make sure that he gets out and, you know, take it to court and everything, pay lawyers and, you know, cost all this extra money uh, to get him out of the house. Uh, however, they'll turn around and sell it uh, sort of like a fire sale for a fraction of the cost uh, to either one of their friends, cronies, maybe secret brothers in these like secret brotherhoods perhaps, uh, but they're uh, selling these houses to basically as a fire sale for pennies on the dollar or a fraction of what <laughs> the original homeowner owed. And it, it's just, it's all about greed because, see, when these banks uh, foreclose on a home, they have insurance on that. And so they're, they're able to sort of double dip that way. And let's not forget the biggest part of this scam that actually involves the very beginning of the mortgage or the death note that was issued by the bank. Uh, that mortgage, that loan that was given to the homeowner to begin with, that money never existed in the first place. That bank did not have that money uh, in their vaults to cover the loan. Uh, in fact, it was the homeowner's signature that uh, gave the contract its value. And so even though the bank may sell, you know, we're using the same analogy, uh, Joe Sixpack owed, say, 50 grand on his house, and that he had been paying 10 years on the mortgage. However, you know, say the house was only worth $25,000, or if he'd have sold it, he'd have been $25,000 short, is a better way to put it. Uh, so he would have had to pay $25,000 to sell his house. And again, this is all based on a loan from money that never existed. Uh, that loan was issued by a bank and signed by Joe Sixpack, but that bank didn't have the, the wealth or the cash or the reserves on hand to cover that. And so the fact that they uh, will turn around and sell that house for maybe, you know, sometimes nine or ten thousand um, dollars if it's in bad shape or 
if it's in a bad neighborhood and it's hard to sell. Uh, whatever the case, they will do that because, again, uh, they have insurance on, uh, you know, foreclosures. They also hedge their bets, so a lot of these CEOs actually bet that their companies will fail just in case. You know, it's sort of like uh, if you're playing craps, you can hedge a little bit. And um, that's the biggest part of this scam that most people never understand. Uh, they faithfully pay their mortgage every month along with the interest that the bank accrued but again the bank never had that money uh, they didn't get any sort of funding or anything from the Federal Reserve to allow for that loan uh, your signature is what gave it the value and it's also what bound you to their contractual obligations and uh, like I said uh, for people to think that the housing prices were going to rise forever and forever is just a daydream because we all know that every financial bubble uh, eventually bursts. And when you have things like uh, basic necessities such as housing uh, increasing in value and increasing in value, just uh, they call it a bull streak where it just never seems to fail. Uh, homes were for decades and decades and decades the best investment you can you can possibly make. Um, however, eventually that has to change because you see those houses that cost, say, in materials, you know, maybe back in the 80s in, in materials, maybe it cost 10 or 20 grand for the materials and say uh, another $50,000 for the uh, labor. So it's a, uh, and this is a very high ball estimate because I've dealt with many general contractors and they do get stuff very cheap, uh, including labor. But so let's just say that it cost $70,000 to build the house and it sold brand new for a hundred thousand so there's profit to be made plus the realtors commission so that's all figured into the mortgage um, however ten years down the road the hundred thousand dollar house is now a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar house now mind you no products or services or anything of value was gained between 1980 when the house was built and sold for a $30,000 profit at $100,000 just in this hypothetical situation um, but you know 10 years later and this happened a lot in Florida especially I don't know much about other states but I know Florida was a really great place to invest in properties um, that $100,000 house may have gone up to 200 or 250,000 uh, California is another good state. Uh, ho houses were just great investments. But again, uh, what's going on here is wealth, imaginary wealth, prospecting, speculation on what the value of a home will sell for is not money, right? Uh, although you can build equity in a house and that house can gain in property values by several different means. There's lots of different ways that houses uh, gain in property values and uh, typically houses do gain in property values. But again, um, you can't give yourself a blood transfusion from one arm into the other and spill half the blood in the process. And that's sort of what's going on when you have the housing market perpetually uh, raising in value under most normal circumstances for decades and decades and decades without fail. This housing bubble that, that was eventually going to burst, and it was obviously burst under controlled uh, sort of demolition via the uh, you know balloon mortgages and the uh, adjustable rate mortgages and the predatory lending and the uh, you know just all around corruption in the real estate business and the federal regulations thereof uh, during the Obama administration but the the point is anytime imaginary wealth is created from nothing where no goods or services are rendered uh, nothing of value is produced and speculation causes imaginary 
money to be created out of thin air, uh, such as in the case of a house gaining in value, then that's adding to the already totally screwed uh, financial system run by the non-federal non-reserve bank. Uh, which, again, they create wealth out of thin air and just print money and add money into the digital currency, you know, world in the cloud or whatever, uh, perpetually. And this increasingly lowers the value of the dollar to the point uh, since the, say, 1900, the dollar has lost anywhere from, well, it's got about 2% maybe up to 5% of its value uh, from just over a hundred years ago. And of course, the non-federal non-reserve bank was supposed to have prevented inflation, yet uh, they are the very root cause of inflation by inventing money out of thin air, loaning it to the government at interest, uh, which the government uh, backs their loans or uh, the collateral for their loans is actually our tax dollars. Uh, many people think your tax dollars are going to build uh, fix bridges and uh, fix the roads and help the homeless and this, that, and the other. But in fact, uh, our income tax dollars don't even begin to scratch the surface on the interest payments alone. Uh, we've allowed ourselves to get into so much debt with the non-federal, non-reserve bank when technically they don't have the constitutional right to print or issue the uh, value of our currency. Yet, that's exactly what we've allowed them to do. And now, President Donald Trump, the man of the people, the WWE Wrestling Hall of Famer, has filled his presidential cabinet with so many Goldman Sachsers and uh, so-called elite banksters, it's just ridiculous. But, you know, this wasn't <laughs> about Donald Trump. This was actually about uh, wrestling as another example of one of these uh, sort of total falsities that people get drawn into and no offense to anyone that's a fan of uh, wrestling I've got a lot of friends that really love to watch wrestling and I've got to admit if you know there's been a few times back in the day when uh, you know I might have seen Hulk Hogan or somebody do some stuff interesting but honestly you know how did Donald Trump ever get to be in the Hall of Fame of wrestling I don't even think he's ever wrestled a gold nugget I think he has someone else wrestle his gold nuggets for him he probably pays them well to do it and I know it seems like I'm ragging on the dawn but anybody that looks through his track history and says that he's a man of the people is just ridiculous uh, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard and uh, please don't confuse me for a killery supporter uh, I don't support or subscribe to the uh, mainstream political um, norms such as Republican or Democrat. Uh, it's obviously two wings of the same beast and I don't think that independent or libertarian really get it either because they're still trying to play within the confines of a totally corrupt rigged game from the very top down uh, starting with, well, you could say that the Federal Reserve is a good place to start. The CIA is another good place to start. And by the way, John F. Kennedy Jr., before he was assassinated, planned on getting rid of the CIA and scattering it to the winds and getting rid of the non-federal, non-reserve bank, which has been the primary reason for our hyperinflation throughout history. And small groups of people, the same sorts of people who fomented the Great Depressions during the early 1900s, uh, you know, their ancestors, or their descendants rather, are still up to their same old tricks. Um, they're manipulating different markets in order to make a killing. And uh, finally, the, you know, my last little point on this whole housing bubble thing is that... Um, you know, I mentioned that the banks that uh, loan or set up the loans for the mortgages never had the money to begin with. 
you sign that uh, mortgage and that's what gives it its value and you're now on the hook for a bunch of money to that bank which they never had to loan out to begin with plus interest and by the way you can't uh, interest is a fictional thing you can't have more money than there was to begin with so the whole idea of interest also actually adds to inflation if you want to know the truth in, in, a, in a sort of bizarre twisted way it, it, it truly does sort of indirectly but that same bank now owns real property real land a real house that came from you signing a mortgage that had no value and the bank didn't have that money on deposit until you signed it that's what gave it its value and uh, they call it the old okie doke and that's what the entire member members FDIC banking scam is uh, again, they do practice fractional reserve lending, which means they can loan out 10 times more than they have on uh, deposit, which is uh, just contributing to hyperinflation because you cannot invent money out of thin air. Not to mention they charge interests on all of those loans that they somehow loan out, even though they don't have the money to loan it out. And so interest, again, is money that didn't exist before it was theoretical money added on top of what was loaned and so that actually adds to inflation as well as to you know people's personal debt of course and finally uh, the lowest of the low the mortgage scheme uh, basic necessity such as a home which should always be affordable and when homes start skyrocketing in value, you really need to be careful because basic necessities should not fluctuate in value as we've seen uh, throughout history in the last you know, several decades. Now, when housing values uh, begin to increase, 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 perpetually and I promise I'll get off this topic in a minute but it's very important that people understand this um, the homeowner obviously thinks that's a great thing because it means that they have made a good investment and the home that they paid you know X amount of dollars for is now worth X times three or X times four so it's a great thing for the homeowner um, they've got a lot of uh, latitude and uh, leverage that they can use with that equity and added value to the house so the problem is however when basic necessities uh, start skyrocketing in value the only reason that that can happen is if there are shenanigans afoot and that would be in Wall Street now again what Wall Street does is they take lots and lots and lots bundles they call it of mortgage packages and put them together as um, basically financial products that can be traded and these are usually rated of the highest quality you know sure as gold gold standard sort of uh, financial packages with high uh, yields of return because everybody knows the housing market always goes up and um, very low risk because for the most part people pay their mortgages and these uh, bundled mortgages did very well for quite some time and in fact lots of people all over the world had their retirement pensions wound up in such investments through uh, even government agencies uh, in Canada I believe as well as schools and I think veterans and millions of people had uh, their money uh, invested in these uh, mortgage bank securities and so under the reign of Obama the the reigns and maybe Bush had some hand in this too I don't it doesn't matter they're all working for the same team anyway uh, but uh, within the last you know before 2008 occurred uh, the homing lenders the big lenders were just giving mortgages away to anybody 
really weren't checking them, you know, weren't checking them to see if they could pay, could afford the house and uh, getting people into the home of their dreams. You know, that seemed like a great thing until the property values eventually busted. And, you know, to me, it's no surprise that they spent years, you know, uh, giving out these uh, very risky sort of uh, second rate mortgages, these ARMs or adjustable rate mortgages and balloon mortgages and, and whatnot, uh, like a frenzy leading up to the collapse because um, big banks like Goldman Sachs and others that, uh, you know, Freddie Mae and Freddie Mac and stuff lost their rears because of this. If these banks knew that this bubble was going to burst, what they would do is, is they would feed that bubble and feed it and feed it and feed it right up to the very bitter end. And as that bubble was being fed with these now bogus mortgage-backed securities that were traded worldwide, um, they secretly started selling them off while they were at their peak value and very quickly they lost these mortgage-backed securities lost their value everybody wanted to sell them they weren't worth the paper they were printed on and so uh, this caused a major problem where the so-called too big to fail banks uh, were bailed out by the united states taxpayers now we're supposed to be living in a republic People think it's a democracy, and others still think that it is a capitalist society, uh, which it actually, uh, we live in a sort of neo-fascist or corporate fascist government society in the United States. However, it was intended to be a republic. However, we can go ahead and say capitalist at least, because capitalism does sort of go hand in hand with fascism. But let's just go with capitalism for now, because it's a little bit more, uh, less, you know, charged. But too big to fail, there is no such thing in a capitalist society. Uh, if I open a lemonade stand, and you open a lemonade stand across the street, if I've got better lemonade for cheaper prices, then I'm going to put you out of business. Right? Same thing goes for you. It's an even playing field. And if I go out of business, then people get better lemonade. And maybe I can come and work for you and, and help you make lemonade, right? That's how the free market is supposed to work. Uh, but instead, we have these banks who are involved in the largest financial scandal in all of known history. Uh, it really is that deep. Uh, so many people think that uh, when you talk about the Federal Reserve, you're talking about conspiracy theory. Uh, however, the non-federal, non-reserve bank is exactly as federal as the kitty cat prostitution ranch in Nevada. Uh, they're exactly as federal as Chuck E. Cheese. You know where you take toddlers for pizza parties? And no, that was not a pedophile reference. If you still don't understand what the scam is, I'll just put it one quick way and we'll get right back into the Flat Earth video. This one's going to run long, so uh, hope you're enjoying it. But uh, this is just sort of stuff that's on my mind right now, and I'm incorporating it into a Flat Earth video. So there you have it. Imagine that you and 20 people are stuck on a deserted island. And... Uh, one of these people, or let's just say a group of them, a group of three, um, start telling everybody that uh, they're going to loan them sand dollars in order to use as a currency, and that way they can trade things with the natives of the island. Right, there's a little micro-economy going on on this little uh, hypothetical island. And uh, y you ask the group of people, well, what gives you the right to issue out the sand dollars? Uh, why can't we just go dig them up? And they answer you, well, no, you can't go dig them up. We don't have to go dig them up. We're just going to uh, put on paper here 
that uh, we intend to go and get this many sand dollars and we can go ahead and loan you a note uh, signed by us that we will pay you 40 sand dollars or whatever the amount is but you you have to pay us back interest on top of that 40 and you can't go digging for sand dollars so you're gonna have to figure out a way to come up with extra hypothetical sand dollars to pay us back with to make the numbers work right do you follow me so far and so you ask well what gives you the right to be the only three people out of us 20 on the island uh, in our group to issue out promissory notes or IOUs for these sand dollars and they tell you well they had a uh, committee meeting while everyone was sleeping and it was decided that they would be in charge of the currency for the entire group and it was settled and basically anybody that has any grievances will they will uh, enforce violence upon you and if you try to make your uh, get your own sand dollars they will inflict violence upon you and if you try to invent hypothetical sand dollars without their permission without becoming one of their club or member FDI sand dollar then they will enact violence upon you and this is very much analogous to well Lord of the Flies uh, but also to the Federal Reserve or non-federal non-reserve bank and the members FDIC who are doing pretty much the exact same thing on a, a smaller scale I guess you could say because of course the the Fed the non-Fed non-reserve bank uh, has somehow hijacked the power uh, back on Jekyll Island Georgia in 1913 during uh, they they did the Federal Reserve Act signed in secret while the rest of uh, uh, Congress was out to winter vacation singing Christmas carols around the trees these select group of people and uh, I'm pretty sure that you had a Rothschild or two maybe some JP Morgan type characters Rockefellers you know the the typical guys right and several others but they signed the Federal Reserve Act into law without anyone's consent or permission and suddenly you have a group of private banks that have the ability to issue and lend currency to our representative government at interest which by the way again I hope the sand dollar analogy helped you with this because we can't create dollars and so in order to pay back interest on top of a loan then we have to somehow uh, invent money that didn't exist to begin with um, and of course we can create things of value in order to earn money uh, but it's still uh, interest is it's a fictitious way of uh, increasing money hypothetically and getting people to agree to it so let me get back on point and I'll wrap up this video we've got a little ways longer but uh, yeah I just wanted to get this off off my chest because you know we've been lied to and scammed about so many things I, I just uh, I hope and pray that this country is able to uh, come back together like we sort of used to be <laughs> you know when people would stick together and if the government was corrupt hold them accountable even if that means uh, holding accountable people in the government that you fancy whether that's Killary or the Trumpinator or any of them uh, they are our public servants and frankly you know if they're doing things like bombing Yemen without congressional approval or oversight uh, 
you're doing proxy wars through ISIS and Al Qaeda and uh, practicing espionage against the American people, which has been admitted for years. Uh, and now it's come out that they're even more uh, in your face, even attached to our TVs, toasters, and smartphones. Anyway, wrapping up on mortgage-backed securities, they had already bundled uh, all of these mortgages together into uh, very large uh, AAA financial products that were poisoned. Um, you know, these sort of investments used to be very safe uh, because for a very long time, most Americans were able to pay their mortgages because we had a good economy for a long time. But uh, with the predatory lending and the uh, drop in the economy, especially after 9-11, trade deals like NAFTA, the jobs getting shipped overseas, more jobs getting automated, more jobs getting virtually shipped overseas to like Southeast Asia. In terms of like, you know, customer service jobs or graphic design jobs, technical jobs that can be done uh, from home uh, or, you know, remotely. A lot of those jobs are going to, uh, you know, Southeast Asia. And I hate to use the phrase, but, you know, third world countries is just, uh, just the vernacular. But th this actually brings up a really funny point. Um, here lately, I don't know about you guys out there, but I've been getting a lot of uh, telemarketing calls from robots. And at first they sound human. But then once you've talked to them for three seconds, you know that it's a robot. But we're talking about like not calling customer service and, and waiting, you know, dealing with an automated system, but an actual, you know, robotic voice uh, automatically calling me to try and sell me things and try, try to get me to donate to the fraternal order of police and the fraternal firefighters orders which are uh, by the way freemasonic organizations just so you know um, but the point is um, it's just another because <laughs> uh, I, I guess a lot of you guys will probably unsubscribe for me now but I did a lot of uh, you know well, telephone sales and customer service over the phone for many years. Um, I did a lot of outbound telemarketing, but I was never annoying and pushy, I promise, I swear. And most of the work that I did, you know, on the phones was inbound. And, um, you know, now people just uh, don't mind buying things from me that they already want and I just help them with that you know with like Dish Network and DirecTV and I've worked for real estate companies and just all sorts of stuff but totally besides the point totally besides the point um, the point is, is I got a phone call from an actual telemarketer today and so I started messing with them at first like uh, with my voice and then I thought hey what a great opportunity to, to try to get, get somebody on flat earth because, uh, believe it or not, uh, I've actually got a phone book here. It turns out it's about a year old, so a lot of the numbers are disconnected, believe it or not. But I've been trying to call people and telemarket to them. and uh, Well, I won't reveal my secrets just yet, uh, but essentially do a flat earth conversation, get it recorded uh you know over the phone with you know random people and so I figured when this telemarketer called and it wasn't a robot um, I would go ahead and throw some flat earth at them so it's nothing spectacular but I'll tell you what if you ever want to have a telemarketer hang up on you instead of having them give you rebuttals even though you tell them you're not interested and take you off the list just tell them about flat earth they'll hang up on you check this out real quick <laughs> hello hi can you hear me sir yes okay um you got a call because your name was chosen this is why I'm top winner so congratulations to you are you between ages 30 and 75 years old and married between the ages of 37 and what no no 30 Oh, yes. Okay, for tax purposes only, if you was to win a grand prize, you are responsible for the license, title, and taxes on the vehicle. 
Do you have a household income of $60,000? Is that correct? $60,000, uh, $60,000 what? Do you have a combined household income of $60,000, sir? Because if you was to win the grand prize, you are responsible for the fees on it. And just a requirement that they asked. Oh. Well, let me ask you a question. Did you know that the Earth is flat and stationary? And that the the world is not a spinning sphere. No, I didn't. Yeah, it's true. Uh, it's wow. been yeah, it's been scientifically proven. It it turns out that uh, Einstein and Newton and and all of the ancient Greek philosophers like um, uh, Arist Eratosthenes and Pythagoras were all wrong about the Earth being a spinning sphere in the vacuum of space. Well, I don't know. Are you familiar with gravity and the theory of relativity? <laughs> <laughs> I promise you that every time I get a real live telemarketer that calls me, I'm going to do that again and record it. Every time, because I get a lot of telemarketing calls. I have a home phone, so yeah, silly me. But... Um, I, maybe I'll get one, and I'm going to keep doing outbound calls. I've made like 30 calls, and I've gotten nothing but disconnected numbers, so that was a little disheartening. So maybe I'll, I'll try to get some fresh leads and um, to <laughs> get some people uh, on flat earth over the phone. But uh, we'll get, get right back into the video. I just thought it was funny. I, I actually recorded that the other day, and uh, it came up in this video conversation, so I had to throw it in there. But not exactly my best work, but that was my first time. Uh, pop my cherry. I'm coming for you, Dell. I'm coming for you, Dell, in your wee logic. <laughs> Love you, brother. <laughs> Unfortunately, you know what? One of the contributing factors to the whole uh, housing market crash was people were not able to afford their mortgages. But what's even sick about this is that you had people uh, in the know who knew this was going to happen uh, placing essentially hedge bets, uh, betting that the mortgage industry would collapse. And so, again, to all those people that lost their homes and lost all their equity and lost their asses, really, um, that, that, that value didn't go away. It, it was just redistributed to the banks. And of course they get subsidized by the government, as I'd already mentioned for, uh, for foreclosures. And so they're able to sell the houses for next to nothing. Uh, especially if they need, you know, some work. Banks do not want to do work on houses, that's for sure. <laughs> the ultimate point I was trying to make with that sidetrack and the football analogy was that things that we feel are extremely important and of the highest value are worthless scams. <laughs> and that can apply to like I said, the monetary system, which is a fiat currency and actually is a spell, which is worshipped by most people, unfortunately. Uh, this can also apply to governmental organizations such as, well, let's just see, NASA. Uh, they pretend to go into space. People uh, find NASA in high esteem. People love NASA, many people worship NASA, as well as space, sex, and uh, Virgin Galactic, who's been uh, lying about taking people into space and taking their money for, I don't know, over a decade, and they're always just uh, right around the corner from getting, you know, the next celebrity millionaire into space, but there's always some minor tweaks they have to do so yeah nasa and all the other space agencies for that matter you might as well throw in ross cosmos and uh the japanese and chinese space agencies they're all faking space because guess what it costs a lot of money to go into outer space in air quotes and so they get many billions of dollars per year from the taxpayers 
in order to, uh, you know, compartmentalize their employees and ultimately spend a fraction of their budget making really quite cheap B films of themselves, you know, going out into space, just like they've been doing ever since uh, the Apollo missions. So, you know, you can apply this, this same fact of life to so many things, uh, many things that we thought were important and valuable are completely irrelevant and really the most important thing right now this day and age is the truth it is revelation uh, it's time for people to start waking up to the truth about flat earth and other hot potatoes and um, I hope that I can really help more and more people to do that God willing and I hope that more people uh, you know begin to do the same because people need to come to terms with this truth and then uh, start taking steps towards figuring out who they are as a person because unfortunately uh, we indeed build our ID or our id or sort of our psyche and, and our spirit on our worldview subconsciously it's very very deep and so if your worldview consists of uh, well believing that you're insignificant then that's going to have profound effects on your health on your self-esteem on your ability to f function to your highest caliber and that's one of the biggest, you know, reliefs and uh, one of the most beautiful things about realizing the truth about the stationary plane Earth is it really does uh, put a lot of meaning into life itself and it puts a great deal of meaning into uh, human life especially because uh, we are unique in the quote-unquote animal kingdom, you know, if you will, uh, in many regards, uh, in terms of we're self-aware, we're able to uh, ponder right and wrong, communicate, and uh, I have seen some arguments that, uh, what is it, bottlenose dolphins are possibly smarter than humans, although unfortunately for them they don't have opposable thumbs, so I don't think they're going to be building anything anytime soon, <laughs> right? Uh, the, the point is, is uh, this revelation of truth that was promised to us thousands of years ago is finally coming to fruition and I'm really glad to see so many people uh, getting on board with this it's very encouraging uh, I, I see the creator of all things hand at work here and it's really a, a beautiful thing and uh, I'm just glad to you know, have had sort of a front row seat to this thing for the last couple of years. Now, back on track, uh, a couple of quick mentions. Don't forget to sign up for the Flat Earth Conference in November 9th and 10th of this year, 2017. Uh, it's going to be in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina at the Embassy Suites. So uh, go to www.fe2017.com if you would like to... Uh, you know, get your tickets. I think there are some discounts going for that still. Um, myself, as well as the Globebusters, will be there, as well as a ton of uh, other, you know, really great and popular and lovable and awesome uh, flat earthers. Uh, so it should be a blast. Um, hopefully, all you guys can make it out there. Uh, also, I wanted to give a quick shout out to uh, my brand new Patreons. Uh, thank you guys so much. God bless you for your help. I, I really couldn't do it without you. Um, of course, my subscribers, thank you guys for hanging in there and resubscribing, even though they're trying to kick you off my channel. Um, if you do get a chance to see this video, just uh, double check my videos list and see if there may be some videos of mine that you haven't seen yet, because odds are there's a bunch of them. YouTube has done a pretty good job of hiding my videos even from my own subscribers, so I guess I'm sort of complaining here. Um, big shout out to Thomas uh, V. Thank you so much for your support. 
Thanks again to all my patrons through Patreon, as well as my supporters through PayPal. Um, you know, just a, a handful of people have helped out, and it's made a world of difference. Um, I, you know, I, I couldn't have done this move, and I uh, couldn't continue making videos without the support of the community, uh, especially now that YouTube revenue is basically like, well, it's almost like working for the chain gang, <laughs> where you get paid like, I don't know, like 2.9 cents an hour or something, I, I don't know, maybe that's not quite so bad, maybe it's worse, I don't know, I may, I may make more money if I get sent to prison and work on the chain gain, so... With that being said, uh, don't forget that you can support this channel direct through PayPal to www.paypal.me slash themorgyle1 uh, or direct through regular PayPal to j-o-n-e-lance at gmail.com. Also, if you guys would like to support my efforts and this channel through uh, Patreon, the link is www.patreon.com slash themorgyle. I'll put a link right here. Um, you can you can uh, become a Patreon for as little as one single dollar per month. And don't worry, don't worry, I already figured it up for you. It's only 3.3 .3 cents per day or a tenth of a cent per hour. <laughs> God, I hate when people do that. But it's usually like something ridiculous, but really a tenth of a cent per hour. <laughs> That's ridiculous. That's right, and maybe not even one single dollar per month, and I'll explain why here in a minute. But um, just to give you an example, if half of my subscribers were to contribute a dollar a month, just say a dollar per month, which I'm sure that, unless you're in really, really bad shape, and yes, there have been months that I haven't had a dollar, so trust me, I know. Um, <laughs> but uh, if half my subscribers uh, supported through Patreon with a dollar a month, uh, that'd be $10,000 per month. And, uh, you know, not to sound greedy or anything, but I'm absolutely certain that I can do way, way better things in terms of uh, spending my time focused on uh, making videos, maybe get some equipment that I can use to do different uh, sort of genres of videos. Uh, there are a lot of uh, haters out there. There are a lot of people who say that it is a sin to uh, do uh, crowdsourcing. But, you know, to me, and sorry for going off on this tangent, but this is something that's... Uh, you know, sort of come up in some conversations lately now that I have started Patreon. But does anybody remember having to pay for movies before you watched them? Like, did you ever go to Blockbuster? Or, like, have you gone to Redbox recently? Or have you gone to the theater and watched a movie and spent $50 on popcorn and sodas? Um, if so, raise your hand if you've ever rented or paid for or watched a movie that you spent money on that you absolutely hated, that you really didn't like, and you really wished you could get your money back, or probably in many cases you wished you could get your two and a half, three hours back that you wasted on the awful movie that you hated but you spent your money on, right? So to me, that's a crappy situation because... What, what what it took in order to get that movie, that crappy, god-awful movie that, that you uh, ended up renting or watching or whatever, uh, it cost probably, this day and age, several million dollars at the very bare minimum. Um, it took uh, a lot of hard work on lots of different people's ends. Uh, they got financing from producers and possibly sponsors to... Uh, you know, pay lots of people and pay lots of actors to make the movie happen. And if that movie absolutely sucked and it was the worst movie that you had ever seen, well, guess what? You're out five bucks or two ninety nine or you know fifty dollars worth of popcorn or whatever the case may be. And that's whether you like the movie or not. You paid for it up front. You hated the movie. 
guess what? You got screwed. And of course, you know, I learned my lesson a long time ago <laughs> after a few sort of uh, stupid uh, repeats. But uh, if you're in the mood for a horror movie, never rent anything from Fangoria, or at least that's my experience from back in the day. Uh, certain production companies are worthless. And, you know, you can call my production company worthless, but I am a one-man show here, and I, I do have a little bit of help from friends, and I collaborate with other people and help them out, too. But even if I have the, the crappiest videos, the least educational, the least entertaining, uh, even if I'm wrong about everything, um, my videos are free, and you don't have to watch them. Uh, certainly, I would, would never ask anyone to pay for my video and then then have a chance to watch it, right? Uh, I, I would never be able to do something like that. That's ridiculous. Um, I, I give away my video content freely because I really want to share the truth. Um, I do monetize with ads, keep them to a minimum, but hey... You know, I do uh, spend a lot of time on videos, amongst other things that I do. You know, I don't just make videos. But the point that I'm trying to make is that I would prefer to, uh, you know, uh, coming from a... Because uh, I, I was a YouTube viewer long before I was a YouTube content creator. And one of the best things about YouTube that I always loved was that uh, the ads were minimum. Uh, way back in the day, you they really didn't have, I don't think they had uh, ads on YouTube at the very beginning for several years, maybe I'm wrong. But um, I, I thought it was great because you could pick what you wanted. Yeah, it may not have all the new blockbuster movies, but guess what? Half of that stuff's garbage anyway. And um, you know, you have to pay for it up front, even if you're going to like it or not. But I just liked YouTube uh, as a viewer because, you know, I could uh, find lots of content from a variety of independent content creators, uh, you know, learning different things from different people, uh, setting my research off on different trajectories based on, you know, social media in general. But YouTube is very powerful because it's focused around um, audio video, which is, you know, one of the most, if not the most powerful form of uh, on mass communication. Um, and so, you know, it's a great platform in spite of all of these recent uh, downfalls. But at the end of the day, I would always prefer to get content for free. And if I decide that that content was worth something to me, then to pay for it. Or, if I decide that, that content is worth something to me, don't pay for it. <laughs> That's the best thing. Hey, you could even give it a thumbs up or not. Um, you could share it on Facebook or Twitter or wherever and or not. But the, the point is, is that it is not a sin to do crowdsourcing. Um, especially, you know, with the whole YouTube thing sort of crumbling around all the independent uh, content creators. So now more than ever, especially in the truth community, uh, we, we need the community support. And uh, I've been very, very uh, blessed uh, the last couple weeks going through an eviction and uh, getting some really really big help and encouragement and just prayers and, and very kind words from so many different people um, it, it really really you know I couldn't do any of this without you guys um, you guys are the best but you know the, this whole thing is hurting the truth channels I, I think AMTV sort of shut down recently uh, Alternative Media Television with Christopher Green. Uh, incidentally, many of you already know, but he uh, recently came out as a at least a globe earth skeptic and I believe a full blown flat earther. And as a matter of fact, I sort of smelled it around January when he did uh, one of sort of a New Year's uh, resolution sort of speech. Um, 
I can just tell by the things that he was saying that he was going to come out as a flat earther. And then I, I think he did that uh, interview with, yeah, Mike Jack, ODD TV. So, um, yeah, it's uh, sort of a shocker to see Christopher Green not posting something every 10 minutes. <laughs> now, I don't know if it's shut down for good, but it seems like he's off YouTube uh, for like the last two weeks, which usually he posts like 14 videos a day. So that's a little odd for Christopher Green because, you know, love him or hate him, you know, he's a pretty large and influential YouTuber. And um, <laughs> he's, uh, you know, getting attacked on his end with this whole thing. So it's affecting the big guys that are in the truth. It's affecting all flat earthers for sure. And pretty much anybody that's in the truth movement, you know is uh, being basically scammed by YouTube, I'm sorry to say. Um, this is sort of a topic for another video, but one final thing on uh, crowdsourcing. The other day, I was uh, just sort of browsing through YouTube and I saw a live video on uh, everybody's favorite channel, PewDiePie, and um, there were 26,000 live viewers on his uh, Hangout, and his Hangout consisted of him playing a fairly new video game, Prey Part 3. Um, I actually played part one several years ago. It was a pretty good game. And from what I saw of what he was playing live for a few minutes, it was, uh, you know, it seems like it's worth a buy or at least a try. Uh, but that's not the point. Um, <laughs> what really I, I thought was funny about this and ironic was the for the five or ten minutes that I was sitting there waiting on something to render, I think, um, PewDiePie was playing um, Prey Part 3 and he wasn't doing a very good job of it. He kept dying and I'm not dogging on the guy but you know, believe it or not um, I kept seeing like within a very short time people sending $100 super chat donations to PewDiePie uh, who does have uh, the most subscribers in all of YouTube history. Congratulations to him. 55 million subscribers. And he literally uh, gets uh, people or people volunteer to pay him to sit around and play a video game. And, you know, nothing against PewDiePie, really, uh, honestly. I, I think he's a funny guy. He's got a good sense of humor, and um, if if anybody makes him mad, just just give him a Pepsi, right? So no, no hate against PewDiePie, but you know it's just so ironic that somebody who's basically not doing anything except playing a video game, and 26,000 people are watching him do it live as he dies over and over and over again. And Prey is a pretty hard game. Part 3 seems pretty hard. But for for someone to crowdsource that sort of effort, I mean, it's their money. They can do whatever they want with it. I'm not hating on them either. You know, that's great. Nobody, uh, nobody calls PewDiePie a, uh, a beggar for crowdsourcing and, and enabling uh, Super Chat. Um, but, of course, he's not a truther channel. You know, he does some, you know, maybe sort of satiric news sort of things. And, of course, he does play live video games and 26,000 people watch him do it, which is just crazy. And not only that, but literally like hundred after hundred after hundred dollars uh, were being put into his super chat. And um, to me, you know, that's great. And I'm glad that, that somebody can be successful doing what they love, really. I think that's great. At the same time, 
I, I don't I didn't see anyone and I've never seen anyone calling PewDiePie a uh, beggar or a sinner for crowdsourcing so w why is there this double standard why is there a double standard to where if you are a truther channel especially if you're a flat earth channel and you uh, open up channels for crowdsourcing uh, so that your subscribers and fans and people that liked your videos can uh, support your channel why is that a sin for truther channels but it's uh it's not a sin for sort of you know bubblegum 12 year old girl geared videos that uh, don't really have anything controversial except for well let's see probably the more f and gds g dams you'll ever hear in a, any 20 minute period <laughs> right you know honestly I, I like to play vi a video game as, as much as the next guy I don't play him as much as I used to but I actually just got done playing uh, the new Doom game it was pretty good but you know is that what is that what I really should be doing you know people say that uh, flat earthers are in it for the money but honestly if I was in this for the money then I would uh, play video games and uh, maybe do some video game walkthroughs and build a channel based on video games oh and maybe like you know jumping in a bathtub full of uh, fruit loops or whatever because I really think that that sort of bubblegum, sort of mindless, pointless, non-controversial, big, large advertisement for a video game, or Fruit Loops for that matter, uh, which perhaps, I'm not sure, you know, perhaps PewDiePie is getting paid by the uh, game distributor to, to do that. A lot of people don't know this, but you can... Um, you can monetize on YouTube through product placement. So, like, if I drink a Coca-Cola in my video and say, mm, that was so good, there's a chance that I can get Coca-Cola to pay me for every view that that gets. So I wouldn't be surprised if uh, somebody, not necessarily just PewDiePie, but uh, a YouTuber with a large following could get uh, big... Uh, you know, uh, video game distributors and developers to sponsor their channel uh, and pay them to play their video games. Uh, and maybe I'm way off base here, but I, I think it's possible, and I, it wouldn't surprise me if that's the case. And so, you know, I don't know. And, I, and I'm not dogging PewDiePie again. I'm not calling him a sellout. But personally, I would feel like a sellout if I made videos that were just strictly to, you know, make money for me and try to get as many subscribers and likes and friends and, you know, such as, as I can. And, and trust me, uh, becoming a vocal proponent for Flat Earth uh, will lose many, many more friends than it will gain you. Trust me. But the point to all that was that uh, um, I don't do uh, flat earth videos for the money or for fortune and glory and fame trust me because that is like the really like the worst possible thing you can do if you're after that sort of thing trust me I, I do static plain truth videos to help people to understand the truth even if it takes me 150 people to call me names and attack me and threaten me just to find one single person that'll listen and think about what's being discussed and then go do their own research and make their own decisions. That's why I do this. Now, you know, I'm not going to complain if I can, you know, make a little bit of money on the side uh, doing this. But, 
you know, like I said, frankly, truther channels are being basically dismantled systemically by uh, Google and YouTube Alphabet themselves. And so it's really just a matter of time before you start to see, uh, I mean, God forbid, but I just, I, I'm really starting to see some big names drop out of YouTube. Um, I'm not talking about Brian Mullen. I'm talking really more specifically about um, Christopher Green from AMTV. Um, and by the way, Brian Mullen did not uh, deactivate or did not shut down his channel. He just um, deactivated it temporarily, so it is coming back up. And the Flat Earth Conference is still going on in uh, November. Um, but if I can do what I enjoy, which is helping people to understand the static plain truth and make a little bit of extra money doing it, then you know, oh, I'm a sinner taking advantage of people, right? But that, of course, that's because I'm a truther talking about flat earth. If somebody, and I'm not going to say any names, um, broadcasts themselves playing a violent video game for hours on end um, in front of a live audience, well, why doesn't anyone call those sorts of people out for being, you know, sinners and uh, sellouts and, you know, we're about to wrap this up, but, <laughs> you know, and I, I'm sort of droning on about this um, because it, it's just, uh, to me, it's just amazing what this world has come to. Uh, video games are, you know, they can be fun. Um, I like to play them. But I, I never imagined a world, honestly, like if you would have told me 10 years ago that uh, YouTube would host live events where almost 30,000 people tune in live to watch uh, some guy or girl or whomever play a video game like I don't understand um, it, it doesn't make any sense to me you know it really doesn't and you know if people want to support that sort of channel that's totally their prerogative and I, I you know I hope they give them two hundred dollars if that's what they want to do I would just uh, urge people to support the channels whether it's mine or whether it's others uh, support the channels that uh, you like if you can because frankly the way that YouTube's going if you're into uh, truth and if you're into especially flat earth and other really really major um, attacks on the sovereignty of the nation and the sovereignty of nations all over the world which is always being exposed every single day through this uh, truth movement that's been going on for quite a while and has really come to a head with Flat Earth. Uh, Flat Earth definitely has the New World Order running scared um, and so they're definitely in damage control mode. The trolls and the shills are out in force uh, trying to sway public opinion as opposed to debating facts. And so, hopefully, and, I, and I'm very confident, hopefully we'll uh, see a time real soon where this truth comes out way out into the mainstream, into the open, uh, for everyone to at least consider Wrapping this up real quick, um, I have spoken, I think, even in this very series about the nuclear bomb hoax. And I was uh, speaking with uh, a friend yesterday evening, and uh, we had a talk about something, and I thought it was interesting. Now, I'm 99.999% uh, sure, I might as well go and say 100% uh, sure that nuclear bombs do not exist. Now, what does exist, and I know you guys are all familiar with this, but what does exist are uh, explosives 
And so, if you've got a uh, one kiloton nuclear bomb, that amounts to, I think it's a thousand tons of dynamite. Uh, or one megaton nuclear bomb would be a million tons of dynamite, or the equivalent thereof. And so, what we were discussing, and you know, I really hadn't thought about this before, but this is a good point. Um, let's just say hypothetically the shadow government or we'll just go ahead and say terrorists even though we all know who the terrorists are in this country and it certainly isn't the innocent people over in the Middle East trying to uh, put their lives back together after the United States imperialism over there for the last well, 15, 16 years or so. Using every dirty trick in the book that the CIA has, everything from economic hitmen to uh, puppet governments to bogus foundations like the Clinton Foundation who take advantage of tragedies, central banking schemes using fiat currencies, and of course fractional reserve scams. Or the Rhodes Scholar Foundation, you know, the diamond, the blood diamond guy, Rhodes, yeah, same guy, same foundation. Slick Willie Clinton claimed to be a Rhodes Scholar, but if I'm not mistaken, that was under some sort of uh, inquiry. I'm not sure whatever happened with that, but anywho. The point to all this is that although I realize nuclear bombs don't exist, um, they, they can be sort of, uh, forged, uh, almost to scale, I guess you could say. Uh, for example, if you were to take, like the military did way back during the, uh, you know, after the Manhattan Project, um, they would take literally thousands and thousands of tons of TNT or, you know, other uh, equivalent explosive, but many thousands of tons of explosives and light them all up at once and guess what you've got your nuclear looking bomb with the mushroom cloud and all and it would even uh, you know leave over some radioactive residue radiation would uh, stick around after any explosion of that caliber although they don't have the the ability to uh, light off a nuclear bomb certainly not in a single warhead and certainly not in a suitcase uh, they do have the ability to to forge an atomic bomb and so this is just sort of a prediction and again uh, I'll just go ahead and give credit where credit's due uh, the, the dude I was speaking with last night Mark B um, really I, ha I had never thought about this but there's a very good chance and, you know, this is just sort of a prediction. I'm not going to say it's a prophecy, but uh, let's just say I wouldn't be surprised if um, the these terrorists were to light off thousands of tons of TNT in a single place in order to, uh, well, essentially pull off a false flag and blame it on North Korea, or blame it on Russia, or blame it on a suitcase bomber, uh, when in reality, you know, the only way that you're going to get a thousand uh, tons of TNT to explode is to stack up a thousand tons of TNT and explode it. Um, and that's totally doable. And if the shadow government, or, well, let's just say the terrorists, uh, if they were to do something like that, it would, uh, it would make flat earthers lose a lot of credibility. It really would. Because uh, as convinced as I am, 100% convinced that nukes don't exist, uh, they can obviously, you know, do something similar using low technology however it would achieve the same effect and um, with that being said I know I sort of got off on a tangent here but I just want to thank you guys for watching if you would like to support and become a, a patron on patreon it's www.patreon.com slash the um, 
And again, you can uh, support it for as little as a dollar per month. And um, if you prefer to support this channel through PayPal, there's a direct link. It's uh, www.paypal.me slash themorgyle1. Or you can do a direct PayPal transfer to uh, j-o-n-e-lance at gmail.com should you so desire. It's, it's definitely not obligatory. It's uh, totally up to you. I won't think any, any less of you if you uh, decide to never pledge a dollar, I promise. I, I love you all the same. Uh, for those of you who uh, would like to support, you know, it's, uh, every little bit helps, even if it is just a dollar per month. Um, if half of my subscribers pledge that, then I can do, uh, you know, videos full time and actually increase my production, uh, capabilities. But I just wanted to thank all you guys again for watching special thanks to, uh, my Patreons, um, all you guys that have supported me, uh, through PayPal, through these trying times. Uh, again, I couldn't do it without you guys. Uh, thank you so much for watching. God bless you all. Spread the word, spread the world, and peace. Moving right along to number three, the inner solar system. Now, the inner solar system, and most specifically the planet Mercury, is one of the biggest problems with the heliocentric model, uh, specifically the fact that Mercury itself is often visible well after sunset. Now, this may not sound very impressive at first, however, basic geometry and a dash of common sense prove that the so-called planet Mercury should never be visible after sunset from anywhere on Earth. Uh, besides possibly one of the poles during its respective summer, but even then it would be highly unlikely to view Mercury after sunset, as it is allegedly 137 million miles away from the Earth at its furthest, and 47 million miles away from the Earth at its nearest. Now, much like the orientation of the crescent moon, the hypothetical orbital path of the planet Mercury would necessarily be positioned in alignment to the day side of the Earth as a rule, with zero exceptions. Uh, visibility of space only occurs between the twilight hours, you know, during the nighttime. Therefore, space cannot be observed during the daytime under normal circumstances, of course. Now, once an observer has theoretically spun around past the twilight zone or the terminator line along to the dark side of the Earth, uh, they would be roughly a thousand miles past the terminator line, uh, about an hour after sunset thus rendering any possibility of a line of sight towards Mercury's orbital path as a geometrical impossibility. Now, assuming the heliocentric theory, of course. 
Now, Mercury can often be spotted well after dusk and even after complete sunset, something which defies any rational explanation according to the heliocentric layout. Furthermore, the very small size of the planet relative to the alleged astronomical distances involved from the Earth should uh, kill off the heliocentric values uh, simply due to the angular size of Mercury being out of whack with the uh, numbers that they give us. We're going to pop right back into this, but I wanted to play a quick excerpt from a recent video that I did. It is uh, The Globe is Dead, Section 1, and um, I also did a follow-up to this in The Globe is Dead, Section 3.5, so I'll put links uh, as well as cards right here for your convenience. Uh, as well as a card for the entire series playlist because there's a lot of good stuff in there and I do go a bit more in depth into the uh, measurements in terms of uh, Mercury and Venus and this impossibility according to the heliocentric model of course so let's roll the clip here's just sort of an enlarged top-down view of um, what we're describing here uh, you can see you've got the day side of Earth got sort of the twilight hours um, I would say that the Sun gets a 30 minute boost I don't know from the atmospheric refraction so 30 minutes after sunset would be somewhere around in here and again you know your line of sight is going to be a tangent that's actually giving it some credit there it should be a wider angle going that way uh, but your line of sight is going to be a tangent to that curve and uh, just to put this in a little bit better perspective uh, there's no way to show how small a person would be looking you know off into space from here trying to see mercury or venus um, but just to give you sort of an idea since this is a sphere there's a little guy but oh not that little guy the other little guy not him the littler guy, no, the littler guy, no, the littler guy, the littler guy, you know, so this doesn't even begin, this would be like where the ISS is, so, but you can see that um, looking straight, you know, parallel with the ground is uh, going to appear to be a convergent line with the ground due to the laws of perspective. Uh, however, in order to see, you know, stars over the horizon, you're going to have to look up, so, you know, a few degrees uh, up. You're not going to look down towards the ground. You're not going to look directly at the uh, or parallel with the ground because, again, it can, your line of sight converges with the ground. So in order to see stars or planets, you're going to have to look up. You're, you know, your line of sight's going to be... Uh, a tangent to the curve of the earth so just backing up this all these little guys sort of gives you an idea of how small we the observer would be on this spherical earth and when you get over to you know here and you're trying to see around this huge curve you're trying to see something that's um when you're trying to see something that is uh on the on the day side of, of this area which is the day side uh, the orbital path of mercury would never intersect with our line of sight during the evening or nighttime now again when Venus is at its closest it would be at high noon and when it's at its furthest it would be at high noon on the opposite side of the Sun right uh, same thing goes with mercury when it's at its closest it would be at high noon and when it's at its furthest away it would be at high noon but on the opposite end of the Sun so you'd never see it and not to mention this orbital path would never converge with your line of sight from the earth at night of course so with that brief excerpt out of the way given the uh purported size of mercury and the alleged distances even at its nearest 
um, the angular size of that object would be way too small for the human eye to discern, especially when you're dealing with uh, indirect reflected light. We'll get into that in a minute. Now, they claim that or uh, Mercury's orbital radius is about 35 million miles on average, while the Earth is, of course, supposedly orbiting the Sun at a distance of about 93 million miles, more than double the orbital radius of Mercury. Just for a little bit more background in terms of the heliocentric model's assertions in terms of Mercury, um, it is allegedly about 3.4 degrees offset or misaligned from the ecliptic plane. And so in this diagram, the, uh, you can see the little Earth on both sides of the sun representing, you know, two opposing seasons. And that line in between would be representative of the uh, ecliptic plane or the single plane around which the Earth orbits the sun allegedly. And you can sort of see the red line, the short red line uh, in the center uh, going through the sun, representing the uh, approximate uh, orbital radius of Mercury, as well as the 3.39 degree offset uh, from the Earth's ecliptic plane. Now, this next slide that you see just sort of shows the sun's path relative to the ecliptic as well as the alleged orbital path of the planet or wandering star Mercury. Uh, so what's going on is the sun is traveling in a direction contrary to that of uh, Mercury and the Earth. But just looking back at this uh, first diagram a little bit better, because the sun's path, that'll come in a later section in terms of orbital mechanics. But um, back to this first diagram, it shows that the divergence from the ecliptic in terms of Mercury is not all that great. So you can more or less say that uh, Mercury would be aligned to the Earth's ecliptic plane more or less for the majority of the time, uh, humoring the heliocentric model, of course. Uh, so what this means is that you really can't make the argument that you could somehow get a uh, tilted Earth view of Mercury during the northern summer solstice at midnight or whatever, I don't know. Okay, so let's take a look at this a uh, couple of different ways. Uh, we're looking at the same diagram, which is, you know, pretty much a two-scale model of the inner, sol uh, inner solar system in terms of the orbital radius and, of course, the planets, you know, including Earth and the others uh, being, you know, microscopic to this scale. Uh, Earth would be so small you can't even see it from this view. Maybe I could zoom way in on it and get a, a pretty bloated estimate of what the Earth would be in this sort of size uh, situation. But um, just sort of uh, keep in mind that, yes, these other two orbital planes are slightly misaligned. And especially, let's just deal with uh, Mercury in the center, the central red orbital ring. Uh, that's only misaligned from our ecliptic by a mere 3.2. 39 degrees, I think, if I said it earlier. Anyway, uh, you can pr practically say that all of these uh, planets are more or less adherent to the ecliptic, more or less. And so what I'm going to do to show this one way is you can see the first set of tangent lines that uh, appear here are the blue dotted tangent lines, which represent your line of sight towards the uh, horizon after sunset or before sunrise because again your line of sight is always going to be a tangent to the curve of the earth and say 30 minutes after sunset or an hour after sunset um, that's going to be about your uh, line of sight towards um, visible space maximum uh, coming away from the day side of the Earth or going towards the day side of the Earth because again, once it turns into daytime, 
then visible space goes through the twilight phase and you can no longer see visible space. Um, and so this is a, sort of a conservative estimate giving Venus sort of the benefit of the doubt and stating that you may be able to see Venus under some very bizarre uh, uncommon circumstances if the conditions are right but it would be a